southern Florida, tropical waters, mystical shorelines, and around 20 protected sea creatures can only represent one park, Everglades. Well, maybe not. As we have seen, there are three wonderful national parks in southern Florida, those being Biscayne, Dry Tortugas, and of course, Everglades National Park. Today we are going to discuss how the latter of the three parks rose to fame as a fabulous example of subtropical wilderness located in the southwest corner of Florida. Let's take a swamp boat and propel into the depths of this excellent national park. Our story begins with the native Calusa people of southwest Florida, who occupied the area until the Spaniards invaded the peninsula in the 16th century. Relying heavily on fishing to support their civilization, the Calusa used many different types of shells found in the diverse mangrove environment typical of southern Florida and the Florida Keys to create tools for use in everyday life, as well as barriers for protection from natural disasters as well as neighboring tribes. Unfortunately, their shells were no match for the diseases brought by the European explorers when they landed on the Florida Peninsula in the 1500s. By 1763, when the English gained possession of the land, most of the Calusa had succumbed to disease. After the United States gained their independence in the American Revolution, Spain reclaimed Florida until 1818, when General Andrew Jackson invaded the peninsula in hopes of taking it for the U.S. By 1821, the United States had complete control of Florida, and Jackson, who eventually became the seventh U.S. president, attempted to remove another major Indian tribe from the area, the Seminole. Even after Florida joined the Union in 1845, conflict continued until 1856 when the Seminole were forced to give two million acres of land to the United States government in exchange for being left to continue their lives. The Industrial Revolution arrived in Florida during the first few decades of the 20th century, with towns such as Fort Lauderdale and Miami becoming jump-off points for expeditions in the Everglades. Smaller towns within the current boundaries of the park include Flamingo and Chocoloski, which were located on the ancestral sites of the Calusa. Crop growing and hunting the abundant birds became the lifestyles of the villages, and early settlers in the area had to deal with the hardships of the Everglades, including pesky mosquitoes and horrid storms ravaging the landscape. Flamingo has become one of the campgrounds in the park, and Chocoloski remains a fisherman's paradise along the Everglades coast. Two voices rose to national attention in an effort to preserve the South Floridian landscape, those being Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and Ernest F. Coe. Coe is known as the father of the Everglades, suggesting the head director, Stephen Mather, that a national park should be established in the wetlands of South Florida. Legislation was approved for the park in 1934, but it would be another 13 years before Harry Truman declared Everglades National Park in 1947. Coe passed away in 1951, but is remembered through the park's visitor center, which is named after him. Marjorie Douglas was a reporter who eventually became a writer and published The Everglades River of Grass in 1947, which eventually became the top book on the habitats and history of the area. If Coe was the father of this beloved park, Douglas became known as the defender of the Everglades, speaking out against U.S. engineers who were attempting to build canals, levees, and dams on the swamplands in order to provide safety from flooding to the developing suburbs of South Florida. In 1970, Douglas founded and became the head of what is now known as the Friends of the Everglades, a movement that is still going strong today, even though Douglas passed away in 1998. There are many ways to go about exploring this diverse environment, but it is best to start with a trip to the previously mentioned Ernest F. Coe Visitor Center, which details how the wildlife reacts to the changing climates and warns visitors to be on the lookout for invasive species, such as the Burmese python, now becoming a common sight across the Florida Panhandle. Once into the depths of the park, visitors can choose to hike a trail through the wetlands, such as the Coastal Prairie Trail, a 7.5-mile trail that meanders through the swamps near the massive Florida Bay. Another option to explore the park is by using a canoe or kayak to explore the many passageways in and around the area, including the Nine Mile Pond and Hell's Bay. You might also be wondering about potential threats in the park, perhaps creatures such as the invasive python or crocodiles. Well, the story of one such animal named Cletus the Crocodile is a great example of how the National Park Service is truly dedicated to ensuring the safety of their visitors. In 2017, Cletus started posing a danger to visitors in the nearby Dry Tortugas National Park, which led to MBS staff carrying him via seaplane to Westlake and Everglades, where he remains to this day. Everglades National Park presents a spectacle for newcomers and returning visitors alike. It has a rich history and stunning natural scenery to back it up, showcasing another great decision on the behalf of the National Park 